turn with me this morning to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, the book that we've been looking at, and the chapter we've been looking at. Hebrews chapter 13. We're going to be reading verses 1 to 5 today of Hebrews chapter 13. It's an absolutely incredible and wonderful book, and I do encourage you to pick it up at home and to read through it and to work through it. But Hebrews chapter 13, reading from verse 1. The writer says, keep on loving each other as brothers. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners, and those who mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money. And be content with what you have, because God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we can say with confidence, The Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Wow. Let's come to pray. <clears throat> Gracious and eternal God, we praise you this morning for being a great and a mighty and a holy and a sovereign and an awesome God. Lord, that you, who are the ruler of the universe, residing on a throne, are so high, and yet we can come before you this morning and speak to you as the living God and have a message from you today by your Holy Spirit. May you speak into our hearts by your Holy Spirit. May your Holy Spirit move up and down the aisle and amongst the pews. May you touch our hearts and our lives where we are at. May you impress these truths upon us and open our minds and our understanding. Help us to leave here challenged and in deep thought, but with lives that are changed eternally before you, so that your name is glorified we hear the words from you, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. Lord, glorify your name, for you are the King. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen. We turn back to our study today in Hebrews chapter 13, and we've got to call this chapter Christian Ethics or a Believer's Behaviour. Christian Ethics or a Believer's Behaviour. And it's really just practical theology. Practical theology. Now as I said last week, where there is an instruction to behaviour in the Bible, there is always first the instruction to doctrine. Where there is instruction to behaviour in the Bible, there is always firstly before it instruction to doctrine. And it's no different here in this book. And that Hebrew chapter, Hebrews chapter 1, all the way through to the end of chapter 12, is Bible teaching, or what we could call today doctrinal teaching. In that before we're exhorted on how to live and walk before God in life as Christian men and women, we're told and we're taught together about Jesus Christ. Who he is and what Jesus Christ has gone and done for you and I. And this is a very, very important reminder for us that doctrine or, uh, doctrine or what we call Bible teaching, Bible teaching is absolutely foundational upon which our Christian duty in our lives is actually built. In that our practical lives as Christians is only possible when we have a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Well, let me put it this way. It is only because of what Jesus Christ, Christ, has gone and done for you and I, that you and I are able to then follow what is taught to you and I in Hebrews chapter 13 as a practical way for daily Christian life. In that no person, no person in life is able to go out there into the world and live the Christian life unless they know Jesus Christ and His teaching, His doctrine finish. As Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 on this, he says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in the view of God's mercy, what? To offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Now what are the mercies of God there? What is being spoken of in Romans 12 verse 1? They are the doctrines of the Bible. And so says Romans chapter 12. On the basis of what Jesus Christ has done for you, doctrinal teaching, God's mercies in life, here is what you are now to do for Jesus Christ. You are to go out and offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God through Christ. That is what the New Testament teaches you and I. 
and this is so very important, not only in terms of being able to go out and live the Christian life, but also because if God has given His doctrine, His teaching to the church, for you and I to go out and in our own lives proclaim that doctrine to the world, then we ought to be able to match it up with our life. Right? For example, if I tell you that a certain soap cleans incredibly well, and I've been using the soap all my life, and I stand before you looking like the dirt man, you are not going to be somebody who believes me very easily. In fact, you're going to be reluctant to believe me. If I stood up before you this morning and I tell you about an outstanding motor car that's better than any other car on the market, and I tell you that I really wish I could show you the car, but it's in the garage because it's broken down and they're trying to fix it, you're going to be a little reluctant to actually believe that that car is all that I've got and made out to you in life. And that is right. And it ought to be like that. In that it's the old story. If my life does not match my mouth, then you really don't want to hear what I'm going to tell you about in life. You don't want to hear what I've got to say. And this is exactly what we've seen here together in Hebrews chapter 13. In that if my pattern of living cannot corroborate my doctrine, then I've got absolutely nothing to say to you as an individual. Nothing. God wants you and I to witness to the world. He wants us to rise up and to and communicate His truth. But in order for you and I to stand and to communicate the truths of God, we need to be living a kind of life that backs up our communication before the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is really the essence of Hebrews chapter 13. To remind you and I again and again and again that not only is teaching doctrine something that's so vitally important for daily life, but to have the right doctrine without the life dishonors God. It makes Christianity, our faith, to be a joke. It calls God an absolute liar when He talks and He speaks to you and I in the teachings and the pages of the Bible about a changed life because of that doctrine. And we make Jesus out to be an absolute fraud to the world. Have you ever sat back and thought about your Christian life in that way? And so doctrine and practical holiness is absolutely foundational to yours and my life and existence. Now with all that in mind, we come back to this chapter. And in doing so, let me remind you of three things that we have looked at and we've been told as we've worked through this chapter together. And that is, firstly, we have seen that one needs, if one is a Christian and one is saved through Christ, therefore, to go out and love our fellow believers as brothers and sisters in the Lord. We are to love them. We are to care for them. We are to echitonase in the Greek, literally stretch the muscle of love out as far as we can reach that muscle out, and we are to love other Christians. We are to care for them. We are to have the deepest compassion for them. Secondly, we are being told to have a love for strangers, whoever those strangers are, be they Christians or be they non-Christians, because you just don't know who you've got. Some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Hebrews 13 to. And thirdly, we've been told to have compassion on those who are mistreated, to care for and to bring before God those Christians who have been thrown to jail simply because of their Christian testimony and their stand for God in daily life. To pray for them, to care if, we are, if possible, to reach out and supply the needs of their family and their children and to care for them as a visible testimony and a witness to a watching world of our love as God's people through Christ. All of us we have been repeatedly seen. An unbelieving hostile world is a world out there today that is watching you and I. A world that wants to rise up and point a finger as it sees us fall and fail in our Christian life and walk before Jesus. And so again, here is a major reason why you and I want to go out and live a certain way. Not only because of what Jesus Christ has gone and done for you and I, but also because we want and need to be a witness to the world for Christ. 
Now today I'd like to look at another Christian ethic, and this time in regards to ourselves. In regards to ourselves. And that is the ethic of contentment. Contentment. Look at Hebrews chapter 13 there and verse 5. The Holy Spirit says there, and I'm reading to you from the King James Version, which is closest to the original Greek. He says, let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have, for he has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Let your conversation, and therefore the way you think, what comes out of your mouth, and therefore what you speak on a daily basis, be without covetousness. In Luke chapter 6, verse 45, our Lord Jesus said on this, the good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored in his heart. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And that is where the root of covetousness lies. It lies in our own deep-rooted hearts. And it affects all of us in our own daily lives. Be it materially, relationally, financially. Perhaps it's in our status. And that if we are not satisfied with what we have in life, and we're not satisfied with where we are in life, we will be continually seeking after something else to satisfy that deep need that's been rooted in our own soul. And covetousness is a terrible, terrible evil, a terrible wickedness before God. Whether it is coveting money, or it is coveting things, or it's coveting position, or it's coveting power, or it's coveting possessions, or it's coveting somebody else. Whatever it is, it is a gross thing. In fact, the leaders in the early church were not even allowed to have it as a character trait before God. For example, look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. The Apostle Paul wrote in the King James Version, A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of but one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, not a striker, not greedy for filthy lucre, but patient, not a broad, and I watch this, not covetous. Not covetous. A spirit of covetous was just not allowed to be amongst the people of God, starting with the leadership in the Christian church and filtering all the way down through God's people. This is why the Apostle Paul turned and he said in 1 Timothy 6 verse 6, he said, but godliness with contentment is what? Great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Do you want to be at peace in your life? Are you somebody who looks at the world around you at the moment and there's absolute turmoil in the world, there's turmoil in our country politically, there's turmoil financially, there's turmoil in business, there's turmoil all the way around you? Do you want to have a deep-rooted peace in your life? Then be happy with what you have. Be happy with what you have. Godliness and contentment always go together before Christ. Charles Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher of the 19th century, went and made this comment. He says, I've been in many, many testimony meetings. And I've heard a lot of people sharing how they've gone and sinned and how they failed Christ in their own daily lives. And he said, in doing so, I've had a number of people come to me over the years to share with me as their pastor how they have failed God and how they need prayer in a certain area of their life. But he said, in all my life and in all my ministry, I've never ever had a person come and confess the sin of covetousness to me. End of quote. Never. Now generally speaking, that's true. But is it not a sin that every single one of us here has had to fight? As it has gone and originally reached out and grabbed at our minds and grabbed at our hearts at times. Let's be honest. That bigger thing, that better thing, that nicer thing, more money, a better position, even if it's just nice to have the position, a fancier car, or whatever it is. It is perhaps a temptation that has gone and hit us all at some point in our own lives. 
And it's a very, very serious thing in God's sight because it reaches out into yours and my heart and it literally destroys our relationship with God. And so God says, I want you to be, in a word, satisfied. Satisfied. Do you know who a rich man is in the sight of God? It is somebody who has all that he needs with contentment in the knowledge that God has everything he will ever need. It is somebody who has all that he needs with contentment in the knowledge that God has everything that he will ever need. And therefore to trust God absolutely implicitly as you embark out on the road of life from a Monday morning all the way through to the end of the week. Now these Hebrews to which this letter was written were going through an extremely difficult time in their own lives. In fact, it appears, if we turn and we look at the background to Hebrews chapter 13, that they had gone and lost absolutely everything. Everything had been lost. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32 to 34. He writes to them under the Holy Spirit, and he says, Remember those earlier days after you received the light, when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of what? Suffering. Suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insults and persecution. Wow. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathized with those who were in prison. And you joyfully, what? Accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had lasting and better possessions. Mm. Wow. Mm. And so the Hebrews to which this letter was sent had gone through incredibly difficult suffering. They had faced prison. They had had their, their properties confiscated as a group of people. Now by the time you get to chapter 13, it appears that many in the congregation were coming together and they were saying in the church, we've lost so much. We have lost so much. We better put our foot down and start protesting to the Roman authorities and we need to start getting our stuff back. And what was happening is that their Christian walk with the Lord Jesus Christ was something that was getting sidelined by their constant desire to get back their properties that had been confiscated by the Roman authorities, to get back their inheritances, to get back their properties and their money which they had been robbed of. And so says the Lord here under His Holy Spirit, stop it, stop it. Be content with what you have. Be content with it. For if you've got the Lord Jesus Christ in your life, you have it all. You've got it all. Oh, wonder, do you believe that? Do you really believe that if a man has got the Lord Jesus Christ, he has it all? That if a man has everything but not Christ, he has nothing? If a man has nothing but he has Christ, he has everything. Let's face it. You are going to lose it all one day. Everything. Everything you have. Everything you own, you will lose it. Whatever it is. Either when the end of the world comes, or when Christ suddenly calls, come to yours and my spirit, and he calls us home. Perhaps tonight. Maybe in the rapture. I wonder, have you ever seen a removals van following after a hearse? <laughs> I've never seen it in 30 years of ministry. I often wonder how some people can amass a huge fortune in the world and store it away like a little squirrel. For what? A certain Hollywood actor I heard about this last week, he's worth eight billion. One man worth eight billion. He will never spend it in his entire life. And then he dies. When you could invest it in some area of God's work, as God leads you to invest in it, and receive praise and riches from God, and in the world to come, as you glorify God by it. I'm sure you remember what covetous did to Balaam who loved the wages of unrighteousness. And in so doing, he lost his soul and his life. Well, what about the story of Achan, 
God turned around to Israel and he said, listen, you will not touch the city of Jericho. The city of Jericho is set aside for me in its destruction. You will not take anything from the city. But there was Achan. He was just aching to steal something. And so he went into the city and he took. And he went back to his tent and he dug a hole under his tent and he thought that God could not see him. And he went and buried it under his tent. And he and his family lost their lives under the judgment of God. Do you remember the story of Naaman the leper? A famous general in Syria. And he came to Israel to get healing from his leprosy. And so he went to the prophet Elijah. And he asked Elijah for healing. And Elijah turned around to him and he said, The Lord God of Israel says, Go down to the river Jordan and bathe seven times and you will be healed. And he didn't want to do it. He turned around and said, The rivers of Syria are far better than the rivers of Israel. And his soldiers came to him and they spoke to him and they convinced him. And he went out and he bathed seven times and he did. And he got out on the seventh time and he was healed. And he went back to the prophet Elijah and he said, I want to pay you for what you have gone and done. I, I, I praise the God of Israel and I even want to take a bag of earth from Israel back to Syria. And the prophet Elijah said, keep, said, keep your riches. Keep them. Keep them. And so Naaman took off. But Elijah's servant Gehazi had been watching from the distance. And he was aching to get something. And so he ran after Naaman. And he stopped Naaman and he turned round to the Syrian and he said to Naaman, I've just gone and met two men in great need. Liar, he never met anybody. And he said, I'd like a talent of silver and I'd like a garment. And Naaman turned round to him and said, take double, take double, take a lot with you. And so he loaded up and he ran back to his own house and he put it in his house. And then he went off humbly to stand next to the prophet Elijah. And Elijah turned round to him and he said, Gehazi, because of your covetousness, you will have the leprosy of Naaman, you and your descendants. And his entire family, was, he and his, and his generations, were struck down with leprosy. Do you remember what covetousness did to Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus Christ for 30 pieces of silver? Do you remember what covetousness did to Ananias and Sapphira, who lied before the Holy Spirit of God and was struck down in front of the church of God? Covetousness is a very serious sin and God deals with it very, very seriously in all of our lives. It's not something for you and I to trifle with. Now the most common form of covetousness is the lusting after material riches in daily life. Look at Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5. It says in the King James and therefore closest to the Greek, Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. Now the word without covetousness there is one word in the ancient Greek. It is the word aphelugoros. Aphelugoros. Which comes from three Greek words. A negates the word. Philadia means to like. And agoros means silver. And so verse 5 of Hebrews 13 can read this way. Let your conversation be without the like of silver. Let your conversation be without the light of silver. In other words, verse 5, don't let your conversation and your speech, your talk, your thoughts, your reasoning, your way of life, because your life follows your speech, your heart, be continually thinking and speaking to others and yourself about silver, about money, or material things, what you can buy, what you can't buy, what you would like to buy all the time, so that your mind literally becomes filled with it, it becomes a way of life to you, it becomes a conversation, it becomes your favorite topic, for if you do, you are loving materialism and sinning against God, or as you put your heart on monetary things. In that material things, and money direct your conversation all the time and not God. Not God. He becomes an animal. Now, haven't you met people like that? The moment you sit with them, all they talk about is how they're going to make more money, what they're going to do, and how they're going to buy this, and how they're going to buy that, and buy this, and buy that. And they're Christians, but they never talk about God. And when they do, God sort of just clipped on the end. Just, just a little clip. And do you know what the result will be? An ineffective Christian testimony to the world. A lack of trust that the God of all the earth can actually provide for you and your needs. And a lack of spiritual joy in your own daily life because of it. 
In Luke chapter 12, verse 15, our Lord Jesus said on this, Watch out! Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Did you get that? That true life is not lusting and coveting material things in the world. That's sin. Now, I'm not saying that it's wrong to have money. I'm not saying that it's wrong to have material things or to buy things or whatever they are. It's just wrong to lust after them at the expense of God. At the expense of God. In fact, do you know that the Bible doesn't say that money is the root of all evil? It doesn't say that. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. In fact, do you know Deuteronomy 8.18 says that God is one who gives you the power to generate wealth. God gives you and I as individuals the power to generate wealth. And some of the wealthiest men in the world were godly men in the word of God. You've only got to think of Job or Abraham or King David or King Solomon. But here is the key exhortation. Look at Psalm 62 verse 10. God says, Do not trust in extortion or take pride in stolen goods. Though your riches increase, what? Do not set your heart on them. Do not set your heart on them. Did you get that? Your heart, your way of life, your speech, your conversation, the way you think. And that is exactly where the injunction needs to be given. In Job chapter 31, we read there in verse 24 and 25, If I have put my trust in gold and sent to pure gold, you are my security. If I have rejoiced over my great wealth and the fortune that my hands have gone and grained, in verse 28, then these also would be sins to be judged, for I would have been unfaithful to who? God most high. Unfaithful to God. Wow. To love money, to love material things, whatever those things are. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5. To be continually in conversation about it. To continually be thinking about it, <coughs> talking about it, what you can do. To be seeking after it is literally to deny God. And it may well bring the punishment or the judgment of God in that area in our own lives. This is what the writer is saying. There is no place for covetousness in the life of a Christian. God is concerned about it. He loved us so much that he sent Jesus for us. Jesus is to be the center and the passion of our souls. Not other things. In Matthew chapter 6 verse 25, Jesus turned and he said this. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about what? Your life. What you will eat or drink or about your body, what you wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Little faith. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we, 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 we drink? Or what shall we wear? For what? The pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first His kingdom, that's His reign in your life, and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Question. Has God promised in His own way to supply all the needs of His people? Yes. Do you ever worry about your life? And about what you're going to wear? Yes. Do you have to worry before God about these things? No. Has God turned around to you and said, Christian, rise up and worry? Has he said that? 
No. What is your worry a sign of in Matthew chapter 6, verse 30 then? Little faith. And little faith. When you worry before God, you are saying to God that you have little faith in God, that God can actually meet the needs of your own life and provide for you as His child. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 32, who are those in God's sight who run after the things of the world so that the material delights of the world is continually on their conversation, it's on their thoughts, it's on their hearts, Hebrews 13, verse 5, so that the world becomes the motivation of their lives. Who are they? Verse 32, Matthew chapter 6, pagans, said Jesus. But I carry a Bible. You're a pagan, says Jesus. That's how God sees us. When the world fills your thoughts at the expense of God, you're a pagan. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 7, the Apostle Paul writes these words concerning this. He says, For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. There's the removals there. But if we have food and clothing, we will be what? Content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Wow. And so what are the standards of a believer's life, a Christian life? Is that as God's people, we are to run from covetousness. We're to avoid that spirit and that way of thinking in our own particular lives. And we are to be content with what we have. Thankful to God for everything that God has blessed you and I in life with. In that we're to never, never be more concerned about material things than our own spiritual walk with Jesus Christ. To do so is sin. In Psalm 37 verse 25, the psalmist writes these lovely words, and I pray that they give you comfort. He says this, I was young, and now I'm old, and yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken, or their children begging for bread. They're always generous, and lend freely, and their children are blessed. Why? Well, because their conversation and their trust and their hearts is on God. And God watches over them and He sees where their priorities and their hearts are set. And He blesses their business and He blesses their lives and their families. But by comparison, in Ecclesiastes 5 verse 10, the teacher writes, Whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with it. Never satisfied with his income. This too is meaningless. And that's so very true, isn't it? It reminds me of the story of John D. Rockefeller. When he started off his business, they approached him and they said, What do you want to do? He says, I want to make a million dollars. When he made a million dollars, they said, Now what do you want to do? He says, Make another million dollars. It's the law of decreasing satisfaction. But God calls upon you and I as Christians to be content. Look at Hebrews 13 verse 5, King James. He says, let your conversation, your life, your thinking, your speech, your utterances be without covetousness. And be content with such things as ye have. For he, God, has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Question. How do you and I as Christians get over this hump? We're living in such a difficult world at the moment. Difficult for business, difficult for life, the way people are speaking around us. How do we get over this hump? How do you and I as Christians start to be content with what we actually do we have in daily life? Whether it's a little or whether it's a lot. Well, let me give you some spiritual keys to take home with you. And now, first of all, if you are to be content, you need to have a realization of God's goodness. You need to have a realization of the goodness of God. 
And then I think contentment comes when you realize that God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. Did you hear that? Paul said, all things work together for the good of those who love Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul also said, my God shall supply what? All your needs in Christ Jesus. Do you know God is good? And because He is good, do you believe that God is one who not only saved you because He loved you in Christ, but God is one in His goodness who will take care of you. I think sometimes when we look at life, we don't have enough faith in God's goodness. Not God's goodness to us. Secondly, do you want to be content? Then you need to realize that God is omniscient. He's omniscient. Now what does omniscient actually mean? It means that our God is one who knows what you need before you ever ask Him. He knows what you need. It's already known in Him. He's just waiting to hear it from you. But He already knows. Isn't that a comfort? Do you believe that about God for you? And thirdly, as one seeks contentment in life, one needs to turn, one needs to ask oneself, what do I really deserve before God? What do I deserve before God? And when you turn and you ask that question, you will be content. As Jacob turned around and he said to God in Genesis 32 verse 10, I am unworthy of all your kindness and your faithfulness you have shown your servant. I am unworthy of all your kindness and all your faithfulness you've shown me. I'm unworthy of everything, God. Do you know that everything that you have in life is a gift from God, completely undeserved from God? The world outside there turns around and says, I deserve it, it's my right. The Christian turns around and says, I am completely undeserving. Thank you, God, praise your name. As Christians, we are rich in the mercy of God. The very breath God gave us this morning in getting out of bed to face the day is undeserved. It's a gift of God to us to correct the mistakes of yesterday and to live a new day for the glory of God today and to live a new week ahead and to impact and touch somebody's life today. The roof over our head, our clothes, our food, our loved ones, our family, our friends are gifts of undeserved mercy and grace of God to us. And then fourthly, we need to realize God's supremacy. In that we need to realize that God will never, never, ever give you your wants. But He will give you your needs. For He knows what you need as a loving Father. He can see the future way beyond in your life and what you need in life. And so be content. And to be content, we need to realize that God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. That God is omniscient. We need to consider what we really deserve in the sight of God in daily life. And we need to realize that the God we lived before is absolutely supreme. And in all this, we need a God-focused life. And not an earth-focused life. Just a side of my notes, it reminds me of 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, where he turns and says, Love not the world, nor the things of the world. Our minds and our hearts need to be God-focused as we live life here to the glory of God. Such are the keys to contentment. May God bless you as you go out to use them. Let's pray. Perhaps the Lord has spoken into your heart this morning. We live in a world where there's such negativity. One of the greatest pastimes in our country is to moan and groan about this and about that. Or to talk about how to possibly make more wealth or whatever it might be, what you can buy. 
what's on offer, what's on special. And it does affect us as Christian people. Sometimes the company we keep affects us. We're living in a world where people have very little love for one another anymore. As it says in Timothy, that the love of most will grow cold. These are signs of the last days. Maybe this morning God has spoken to your heart. Maybe about your thinking and your conversation. Maybe what fills your mind more often than God on a daily basis. Won't you just speak to the Lord about that? Recommitting your life to Christ. That the Lord Jesus is to be the center thought, the center focus of our minds and our souls. Righteous and eternal God, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for what your word means to us in daily life. Lord, we know that we so often get so caught up in this, the ways of the world, as your people. But help us to put a break on that today. Help us to stand back and say, this far and no further. Help us to reach out our hand up into the heavens and grab your hand and walk with you day by day. Help us in our daily lives to be more filled with things of the spiritual and things of Christ. Despite the pressures of the work and the situations around us, help our conversation always to have a touch of eternity so that others are uplifted in thoughts of Jesus more than the things of the world. And may you bless us. May your name be glorified. And may we always hear the words from you one day. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Glorify your name, Lord. Help us to be content. Because it's within our hearts to be so. For Jesus' sake, to your glory. God's people say. Amen.